Welcome to our special series of Let's Talk for KubeCon EU, and I'm your host, Swapil Bhatia. My next guest is, once again, Jane Waters, CTO of Modern Application Platform Business Unit at VMware. James, it's good to see you after such a long time, but we are not in the same room. We are not sitting across the table. We are across miles from each other. I know. I'm, I'm used to our little routine. You almost always have like a nice room set up at any of these events with like three cameras pointed down and four mics. And so we're all adapting to the, the virtual, virtual reality this year. Right. And hopefully by the end of this year, things will get better. Uh, but with this, uh, with this uh, pandemic, with this crisis, something else happened, especially for the, this cloud native or uh, this space, is that a lot of companies, they accelerated their digital transformation, their cloud a native journey. Now, what is happening is that 2020 was more or less like everybody was rushing towards it. Now, the things are running in production. And this was a theme even last year or before last year, 2019 also, when we were at KubeCon. Security, security is becoming a serious topic. And now when everything is in production, security cannot be an afterthought. It has to become part of your CI CD pipeline itself. So, so what I want to understand from you is how do you see this evolution of uh, focus on security, especially because of this crisis that we are seeing, or irrespective of the crisis, security was going to become a critical piece of your infrastructure either way. You know, I, I, let's have a quick conversation around that. You know, I've been thinking a lot about DevSecOps. You know, we consider Tanzu at its core to be a Kubernetes first DevSecOps platform. You know, it is a, or a set of, set of components if you like, but basically you bring them together to create a DevSecOps platform for a team to help run. Um, and that's based on Kubernetes, but it, it, Kubernetes alone does not give you that. But then you know you take a little step back. You're like, well, security is really not new as a need. Like, why are we going through this reimagination right now of everything? And of course, the first thing that happened was a focus on agile delivery models, right? So continuous delivery um, really highlights the need for you know the composable, declarative nature of containers, the speed that you get from containers and microservices. Anyway, I, I went all the way back and I started reading old, you know, computer literature. And it was in 1974 that there was a computer magazine that first articulated, a research journal first articulated the idea of least privilege in system design. They said every system should be designed with the least privilege to complete the task necessary. Everyone's heard of least privilege. So this is 1974. How did we get away from that? <laughs> right? Like, least privilege is not new. It's something we've always aspired to. And the way I've been thinking about it is like, okay, well, what is the opposing force to least privilege? I think that was the web and the internet. And these were technologies built for wide open sharing and collaboration. And so all the innovation we've been enjoying for the last 20 years from the web has really been about collaboration first protocols like HTTP, things like even email SMTP were originally designed to be like wide open, you know, unauthenticated, here's my document, please, please share it. And so I think what's happening right now in DevSecOps is we're actually trying to automate these two forces at once. These innovation first technologies around the web and cloud, as well as the security principles that enterprise computing has always aspired to around least privilege. And I think that a modern DevSecOps platform needs to accomplish the velocity and the DevX that developers need while helping to assert least privilege and high security at the same time. And that's pretty exciting to bring what are really the two biggest forces in computer history together, which is like this innovation and collaboration gene of the web, as well as the security and reliability gene that systems design has always aspired to. That's how I'm thinking about it. Is that an interesting take to you at all? No, it does. And also, uh, I know that uh, I, I love your hypotheses and theories. So I, I was looking forward to hear your theories as well. But what I do think, yes, yes, a lot of things are happening, but also the rules are also changing. You know, what used to be developer, then, you know, DevOps and DevSecOps, and we're talking SREs. Now we are looking at everything as infrastructure as code. We are looking at GitOps. So a lot of, you know, responsibilities are also moving, you know, while we talk about shift lefts, you also think the responsibility is also moving to one person. So yes, everybody's running, running everything in root. So forget about root uh, least privileges. It's like, like I want all the privilege because I have to do everything. Well, I think that's the tension, right? Which is that you want developers to be able to get their job done with speed. But then how do you incorporate security into speed? And I think the first step, and this is where DevSecOps really has, you know, some great ammunition is we've started to make 
sort of infrastructure as code, deployment as code, manifest first, GitOps, version control, security scans of code, early shift left. We've started to make these all explicit first class entities in a DevSecOps platform. So, so for the first time, you can actually say, here is my entire application, my entire application infrastructure, everything that I'm about to do as code. How can computers help tell me if that is secure, doesn't have vulnerabilities, um, and is ready for deployment as soon as possible in that developer feedback loop? And I think that's where shift left comes from, is the longer you wait for feedback that part of the configuration or part of the code is insecure, the longer you have to wait to get things to production. So shift left is really an asymptotic to zero need to converge to a zero second feedback loop between when a vulnerability both in configuration or in code is introduced into the system. So I think it's one of these 10 year, you know, missions that we're going to be on. You know, whenever whenever you're on an asymptote, you're going to keep pushing it closer and closer and closer, shifting further and further left. Right, right. No, I agree with you. Also when we do talk about as you mentioned, you know, all those vulnerability that are there uh, you cannot fix something that you do not know. So I think the role of observability is also kind of becoming increasing. And also there are a lot of overlap happening when you talk about security versus having full, you know, uh, visibility into your stack. So what do you think about, because, you know, with Tianzu and Wavefront, what do you think about the role of observability also to that kind of assist DevSecOps? Yeah, I mean, let, let's just take it, let's just keep it really simple. Mm -hmm. Observability of a monolithic system is different than the observability of a highly distributed microservices-based system. So we always wanted observability, but you used to be able to accomplish that with maybe some systems resource monitoring tools and an application agent within the app and on a monolith. And a lot of the communication within the application all was accomplished in memory, right? So if you're talking about a classic Java monolith, if, as long as you had JVM instrumentation and systems profiling, you had a pretty good read on what was happening. And there's still a lot of tools you can do, a lot of techniques for performance management, et cetera. But now we've said for velocity and for cloud and containers, we're gonna break apart these functions. And we're now gonna have networks introduced in between them. And so now we're going to have to watch, and this is where I think the tracing, the distributed tracing has become so important, is that we never had to worry about, you know, kind of system call to system call within a monolith. You're in memory. That's as good as it gets in computing. And now we've got to introduce ideas like distributed tracing um, into applications. And that's where observability is suddenly so important. And the other thing I'd say is that we really couldn't afford the observability systems that we have today 20 years ago because so much data comes out of them, right? Like you're actually dealing with so much data. If you look at you know, the guts of Wavefront, there's a constant systems resource efficiency engineering war being waged there to make it more and more economical. It's truly only recently that we could even afford, thanks to Moore's law, to watch all of this data coming out of our system with traces. And even then, the sampling rates and some of these other ways that you manage the data are super important. So I think we're, we're, observability is critical, but part of it is, is the price we're paying for these more distributed systems and to move with velocity. So again, it's like, it's not really a new thing, but it's a new luxury that we have for the sake of velocity. Does that make sense as a thesis? No, it does. It does make sense. And also, uh, uh, there is, uh, when we do look at cloud native technologies, uh, just look at CNCF landscape, you know, uh, there are so many icons there. It's it's a very crowded, very busy, very, very, it, things get complicated very quickly. Uh, when we look at it from users or customers' perspective, uh, how, I mean, of course, they are talking about security, DevSecOps is become a critical piece, but still, do you see enough awareness? Are they taking you know, uh, it, it seriously? Uh, are they investing in DevSecOps? Here's where I'm pushing right now you know, in this conversation. I want to introduce the model of more of like a Tanzu sort of you know, concept car reference app architecture. And I think this kind of reference app can help show like if you could start from scratch today, here's how to design a secure application. And let me give you a couple of hints of where there are new concepts. The Knative community is doing great things around scale to zero and more of this, you know, serverless style of systems resource management. Where when a system when a, when a node is being used, it can be, you know, scaled out. And when it's not being used, it might just be turned off. Well, let's go back to least privilege. 
I actually believe that one dimension of modern Lee's privilege is the ability to scale to zero and recreate the node. And so uh, imagine now where we start to introduce the concepts of like a time to live uh, as part of a DevSecOps pipeline, i.e., hey, we want to have these nodes, we want to have these you know, system resources within this platform, but we don't want them to ever run for more than two days or three days. I think some of these reference application types where now instead of just getting the velocity from a microservice, your ability to scale it to zero and to restart it rapidly starts to pay off tremendously for security. Uh, imagine if a node only lives one day, how much harder it is to exploit you know, uh, any credentials it might have. You know, if you look at the classic like Equifax hacks, oftentimes these are credentials that existed on these systems for you know, five or 10 years that were exploited. Now imagine if you, you know, get into a system and everything that you're using is going to be recreated by Knative and scaled to zero you know, frequently, you know, you're grabbing at keys that expire or identities that expire. So I think strong identity, ephemerality, and rapid recreation um, are a security payoff of microservices that we really want to help bring to the market. And I think that's how we can start to curate some of these CNCF patterns into these reference apps that help CIOs and CTOs say to their organizations, hey, let's build apps like this. Um, and then therefore our DevSecOps journey is gonna be greatly enhanced. Does that make any sense to you, bringing it all together in a reference implementation? No, it does. It does make sense. Uh, also, uh, as I was saying earlier, and you know, you also alluded to that, that it is a complicated thing, but how is like, of course, that is the whole idea behind Tenzu, but how it further makes things easier because sometimes what happens when things are too complicated uh, uh, and there are so many research they do come out that you know it becomes a roadblock not only for embracing it but uh, they don't roll updates they don't add features because they're worried about the DevSecOps thing blocking so what role is Tanzu playing because as you were saying earlier you know, they should be able to move fast so they should not slow down and stop just because they're worried about some vulnerability let's talk about the basics and fundamentals like the number one crisis I see from leadership within enterprises today is essentially they want to go cloud native, they want to encourage Kubernetes and innovation with their organization, but they haven't figured out a way of standardizing cluster configuration, cluster provisioning, and cluster management yet. Like Snowflake clusters have been the cost of innovation in a lot of these large organizations. Now, how do you upgrade a Snowflake cluster? How do you secure a Snowflake cluster? How do you share skills across teams between clusters that don't have light configuration? So that's where, just to get into the products for a second, Tanzu Mission Control is the SaaS control plane for policy, organizational management, uh, provisioning, day two operations, um, and then over time, you know, uh, service mesh connectivity between clusters. By raising what we'd call like the value line of saying instead of every team making a bespoke tailored you know Kubernetes cluster to start to mechanize the provisioning and policy and configuration of those clusters, I think that's such a fundamental first step in the DevSecOps journey that doesn't get as much play today. Like I think everyone's talking about container scanning. That's cool. You know, a harbor within Tanzu does that. It alerts you if there's a vulnerability within a container. But until you've really industrialized your cluster management, I think some of this DevSecOps play is more inherently complex. In this world, it's like really hard to actually talk about how the future will look like. Uh, but if I ask you, how do you see the evolution of DevSecOps? You have alluded to that in your previous you know, points, but if you look, hey, this is where we are heading. We already talked about the rules are changing, evolving, SREs we talk about. But how do you see that, it, you know, a trajectory you see that, hey, this is how we see it evolving? I think that there will be a clear role of this DevSecOps platform team that's as clear as a cloud infrastructure team, as clear as a hardware team has been in enterprises traditionally. And I think they are going right now from proving that a DevSecOps pipeline is possible in enterprises and usable and the first use cases are being deployed to then driving broad consumption. So I think that role you know, is being pushed on as the future of both cloud as well as, you know, DevOps. And so the, I think that role is super important. And empowering those teams 
to take on uh, more and more of both the developers and the applications within the organization are the frontiers right now. And so that comes down to application modernization patterns, like how do I make my applications more manageable within a DevSecOps pipeline? We'd like to talk about the one factor app there, the one factor being, can I just restart this app reliably? Like imagine trying to automate an app that doesn't like to be restarted. Like you restart it and it, and it hangs and it needs someone to log in and say, oh, well, you know, click this, you know, uh, node on first or some other very imperatively sticky set of uh, commands. So getting more and more apps ready for Kubernetes is a big battle and that's the future. And then, you know, enabling more and more developers to come to Kubernetes in a way that they find friendly. And in some ways, both of those are challenges outside of the core Kubernetes distribution. That's really like this last mile of DevX and enablement and application modernization. So I think, you know, really being thoughtful about how we help organizations set patterns for application modernization is super critical, as well as DevX. So that's that's kind of my prediction of where the where the next couple years of consumption need to come from. James, uh, thank you so much for uh, taking time out today and talk about this very important topic, uh, DevSecOps security. And I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thanks so much. Great to be here and chat with you as always. Mm-hmm.